you know, you're older than me. So, you know, you got a little bit of a different frame of reference here. Okay. So welcome to Carbonite Bounty BS uh, podcast about Disney Plus's The Mandalorian. I'm Scott. Sam. Ken. Tony. And we got it right. We got it right. We got the right order right. We got the process right uh, for the season finale. So thanks everybody. It for only took us. us eight episodes. It, it takes a lo- it takes seven episodes to get everything ready. Uh, so thanks everybody for joining us, Sam. Why don't you tell the fair uh, the fair people where they can find us? All right. Make sure that you first go on nerdcyclopedia.com. That's where you will find out all our links. You'll find out our different articles, our different podcasts. Um, make sure that you are following us on social media at nerdcyclopedia on Facebook. Twitter, Instagram, all our social media outlets at Nerdcyclopedia. Make sure that you are emailing us at nerds at nerdcyclopedia.com. We love to hear, you know, get your feedback and everything on our podcast here. Um, make sure that you are downloading our podcast, listening them to on, on Spotify. Uh, we are now on iHeartRadio, finally. iHeartRadio. You know, iHeartRadio. Uh, make sure that you're listening to us on, um, you know, different other outlets like Apple Podcasts, Google Play, everywhere that you stitch your, everywhere that you um, listen to your favorite podcast, we are there. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And make sure you check out our other shows here on the Nerd Cyclopedia channel. That means Sam and Scott are watching Watchmen, and it also means Nerd Cyclopedia and Nerdendum, and nobody cares. The podcast where I spill my guts and nobody, nobody listens. Uh, Gentlemen, we cut this in half for a couple reasons, just to give uh, our listeners a little bit of the back uh, backstage. Uh, it was Christmas, it was New Year's, I wasn't feeling great, so we decided to push this off after our Star Wars review. But we got to that bonus episode last week, so definitely check that out if you haven't checked it out yet. Gentlemen, I almost got a divorce because Uh-oh. of how this episode uh, split, how episode 7 ended, uh, episode 7, which is uh, The Reckoning. Um, we are left at the end of this episode, which, which we'll get into in a little more detail with, uh, you know, Quill has been shot, gunned down (laughs) and baby Yoda is just laying there in the dust. Just laying there, man. (laughs) And my wife literally said, if something happens to this baby Yoda, we're getting a divorce because you made me watch this. Well, wow. it's Disney Plus. It's not. I know. Happen. <laughs> that works. Okay. Nothing's gonna happen to the baby. Oh, no. Now, if it was HBO, you know, then yeah, we might have you like you know some questions. You know, I was just Disney like, Plus, they, yeah. This is Disney. Like they they know what to do with the Golden Goose, right? Like they've their steamboat really still under copyright, so Disney ain't yes. letting one go to way. Um, also, I'm just gonna show this off since we're talking about her. She got me this rad T-shirt. Check out this T-shirt, everybody. Oh yeah, right. Mando and the child. Yeah, buddy. It's Calvin yeah. and Hobbes style. It yeah, is yeah. awesome. So thank you yeah. very much to awesome. Awesome. Uh, the woman who won't divorce me because of how uh, the show ended. <laughs> so thank you uh, to John Favreau for saving my marriage. There you uh, go. This duet here, this two parter, is is just full of uh, a return to places we've been, and. and <clears throat> My favorite. So we start out here with Carl Weathers, <laughs> Grief Karga, who says, um, "Give me another sparring partner," because he's gonna kill someone with his, with his right hook. Uh, makes a proffers <laughs> to the Mando here. Uh, what did you guys think about this as far as as far as its likelihood of being a trap? Who's got some <laughs> who's got some thoughts about this uh, this message we get from Carl Weathers? <clears throat> Well, I mean, I, I love like the Skype, <laughs> the Skype messaging and everything. Um, <clears throat> so it just plays to me like you know, it's, it's like a, another video game, you know, mission. You know, I got a mission for you. Uh, if if you, um, you know, if you do this one last mission, like a Western or whatever, yeah. you know, if you do this one last mission, you know, you got a great, you know, bounty ahead of you and everything. You, you just got to do this one last thing. And the way Carl, uh, grief talks. Just the way he like you know he missing it uh, uh, talks himself and everything. It's just it's just so funny to me because he he speaks out. He doesn't speak to you. He speaks out. So <laughs> the the chances of it being like an ambush is like highly. But you know we gotta just play through the process. So I, I thought it was I thought it was, I, I love why, when he's on screen now. You know I just love it when he's on there. <laughs> Ever since we could forgive him. I think for uh, for shooting up shooting up uh, the Mando on his way out of Navarro, right? Uh, now that we can forgive him of that, uh, Ken, the there's a, a band uh, getting the band back together piece here. What was your favorite 
Who's your favorite uh, revisited character that we got to see here? Um, Quill. Okay. Yeah, because he's sort of the Obi-Wan mm. character. You know, he's sort of the binding you know, he. Uh, I think he. I think he brings sort of a, a calmness and a centered. And you know, when people start to get kind of, hey, let's go get him, let's go out, and you know, he said, no, nope, wait, you got to think about what you're doing first. He's sort of the obviously the sage, uh, in the whole situation. I like seeing him. Don't like what happens, but I did like seeing him come back. He was probably be, and of course the the, uh, IG, droid. Like to see that too. But I liked Quill coming back i thought that was pretty cool awesome tony did what did you think did you like did you like seeing cara dune here and a little and a guest shot here yeah i mean it was exactly like getting the band back together that's a great way of describing it and it was great i mean still it's, it's hard to be carl weathers character <laughs> i mean that, oh, he's coming back yeah. it's just you know you're getting to learn more about just you know the delivery that he does and it's just very believable that's the one thing about it of I really just like his character a lot. He's my friend. I also really do. I mean, we don't really talk about the IG character mm -hmm. is, you know, okay, we got him reprogrammed. Don't worry about it. Nothing's going to happen. But you got to worry about it. Well, is that true? Is there some programming going on in the back that we don't know about? Mm -hmm. So those are my two favorite characters that came back. Uh, I, I, I thought the IG-11 was super, super nifty mm -hmm. seeing him, uh, you know, come and... One of the things about about a droid like that, when you get a the glimpse of him in the first episode, you know, uh, it's you know he's gonna do something really awesome. Like they don't bring you don't bring IG Eleven back so that he so he sits on the bench. You know what I mean? Uh, it's like there's this great Simpsons episode where Marge gets tied into the mafia, and the Japanese Yakuza come uh, comes and they have a fight in the front yard, and Homer says, "I don't want to go in." There's a little guy sitting over there. He hasn't done anything yet. You know it's gonna be super <laughs> cool. Uh, and they go inside and you hear. Ah! you know uh, he does it um i definitely got that feeling with ig11 and you know there's something about the inhumanness of the robotics but it's dedication to nursing which is just touching to me uh, mm. this IG part. you know no i just love to be able to reprogram i mean i can't even go from like windows millennium to windows 10 <laughs> <laughs> like, I can reprogram a whole droid. I mean, yeah he great. just reprogrammed that whole droid and everything and yep. you know that, that was that was awesome to see quill is he's a he's a really decent character i like him mm. he's a maker nick nick nolte come on yeah, mr nick nolte anyone's talked about nick nolte you yeah, about <laughs> <Carl> weathers nick <laughs> nolte has been around forever i mean he's, yeah he, yeah he was in a movie with eddie murphy for guys yeah. yeah yep yep He's a legend. Yeah. He's a legend for looking crazy. Crazy uh, after a, a Sunday drive, Nick Nolte. And he looks like his character, too. He, he looks does. like Quill. Quill he does. looks like Nick Nolte. This, like 100%. There's definitely not a Rick Astley thing where his voice sounds wrong. You know, <laughs> yeah, right. uh, which, I, which I appreciate because that weirds me out a little bit. Uh, what about. Quill talks about being a crafter. And he makes this, he makes a new bassinet for the child. Um, it's, it's interesting to me that Quill is, is seen as a protector like this. Like he creates not just the, the actual physical protection for the child, but he creates the, the overwatch for the child. Uh, and, and, and I think that's such a, such a, a great legacy for the character. Um, well, remember at first he denied when, when Amanda asked him to watch the baby, he's like, that's not what I do. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not, you know, I don't, I don't do that, but. I'll have, you know, IG-11, you know, help me out with this. And Mando was just like, no, I'm, don't let that droid anywhere near this baby, <laughs> you know. And, you know, Quill's like, I'll reprogram him. He's straight, you know. But, you know, Mando was still doubting and everything. You blew his but... brain out. <laughs> I, I had to replace the whole brain. You, you got it. You got the brain. So it was great for him to, to accept that. And, uh, you know, for Quill to just, okay, well, I'll do it so long as I can, you know, do it with the droid. Mm. Uh, super interesting, and and it, and that imbued, you know, the death the death of Quill here. And since you know, we're obviously spoilers. We're not going through this chronologically, but the death of Quill and the legacy that he get, that kind of lives on in IG Eleven is so uh, is so interesting. And you know, not to jump too far ahead, but man, IG Eleven delivers on that promise of badassery in mm -hmm. in in a way that's extremely satisfying. 
uh, in a way that right to the end. Yeah. It delivers like classic star Wars deliveries. And, and that's something that in my opinion makes this superior to rise of Skywalker because it does that, that thing. Uh, it's my only, my, my, that's the only thing I'm going to say about comparatively because they're different things. Really, they are. Uh, the Mandalorian is more of a dirt show. You know what I mean? It's a Western. And the other is more of an opera. So I feel like that you got so It's a quieter show compared to a whole orchestra, you know? Yeah. Like you said. <laughs> There's definitely nobody, nobody shooting lightning out of their fingertips <laughs> in the Mandalorian, you know? Uh, people get run to ground and, you know, posses go riding out. So uh, <laughs> yes. yeah, totally different situation. Uh, it's crazy that you know this universe has that in it mm -hmm. um and it all happens in the same universe you know you got one end of it you getting um, um force lightning you know coming out of somebody's hands and on this end of the universe you know you it really would be strange to see something like that in this show and you know we talked a little bit about this uh during our review and it, we we consume all this star wars media in real time so if you're watching everything in order throw that that uh, rise of skywalker review right before here um, but we talked a lot about how, you know, we talked a lot about how Rise of Skywalker and the Mandalorian were different in tone, and it's a Western versus an opera. And one of my favorite instances of that is this, this sort of like, um, like every beat of this story you can tell is a Western, right? The healing, the, the healing thing. Oh, that's what I meant to say. The Rise of Skywalker took the force healing thing from Mandalorian and applied it to Rise of Skywalker. So I remember we were talking about continuity. And we talked about how Solo had those dice. And we got that in Episode 8. And here we have the Force healing, and we got that in Episode 9. Um, interesting to see how, uh, you know, the child is able to do this and not die. Um, <laughs> apparently that's something that's afforded only to the Yoda species. Um, what well, the, you... child, the, child, the child is, like, real protective, too. Because remember he um, almost choked Kara, you know, for... You know, being like real aggressive and everything, he was right. like, "Oh hell no!" <laughs> you know, I'm gonna use some of my force and everything to, um, you know, to to he he could almost you all could almost um almost look at him as a protector of Mando in a way. Mm -hmm. You know, Mando's protecting you know the child and everything because he's such a you know little child and everything. But whenever there is like you know crazy danger, as we will see later, you know, um, in episode eight, the um the child just steps up and does the uh, the big protection. Yeah, well, isn't it sort of a life debt situation? Like Han and Chewbacca, mm. Jar Jar Binks and Qui Gon Jinn. Mm. It's a, it's a, it's the same type that of thing. relationship. They mm -hmm. both there was a there was a there was a debt that needs paid. Sort of. It just it just happens. It's it's the relationship that happens in the galaxy. Just it, how it, how it works. They should have I mean, left him in Gungan City. I'm oh, sorry, Tony. Go ahead. I was going to say, there is a lot of connection that goes through. Like, uh, so many characters are not aware of their force abilities. You know, it takes a lot of training. It's, you know, there's so many times where the child does things and, oh, like, you know, did I do that? Or just not really aware. And then sometimes can do amazing things. But it's all about controlling. And then there's an underlying theme of sacrifice that goes through all of Star Wars. Different characters. What I thought was unique was IG-11 doing the sacrifice. So that was a little bit different. So many characters have gone from Obi-Wan from, you know, at the, the very first time to now. So I just like, there is, you know, underlying things that interconnect everything together. You just got to really look for it, though. That's all. Underlying theme of sacrifice. That is a, yeah, great, great theme right there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, Quill sacrifice running back with the child. But... I Grief, Grief Karga is sort of conversion here. Um, those are my dogs, everybody. If you're hearing okay. them. My dogs are excited about something. They'll stop in a second. Uh, so, so Grief Karga sort of turns the corner here and murders his subordinates. <laughs> you guys done? You guys done? Yes, Daddy. Uh, uh oh. Whoa. Come here, bud. Come here. Come here. All right, sorry. All right, I'll cut that out. Um, so. No, leave that in. <laughs> <laughs> so the child, so the child heals oh. grief Karga, and it seems like there's a total 180 here. Um, mm. what did you guys think about that pivotal scene where the child heals grief after the Minoc attack? Uh, the child just has that element of like, you know, um, he, he has that element of goodness in it. 
you know, the child is just a good hearted, you know, protective. And I, I think the child sees that element of goodness in grief. So why else wouldn't he, you know, um, um, why else would he not choose to, you know, heal? You know, as we'll see at the end, grief ends up changing his mind um, about the ambush and everything and, um, you know, siding with um, our, our heroes. Donnie, what do you think about that moment where the child heals grief? Um, you know, it, it was cool. Um, I didn't think that the child would be able to do that much. Again, we've seen a lot of, you know, forced ability. But I'm like, whoa, that's, you know, I mean, he's got a lot more than we ever thought of being able to do that. Um, you know, again, I'm glad that that episode came before The Rise of Skywalker. So it's kind of maybe a foreshadowing of, okay, you know, this is what can be done and we're going to see this again mm -hmm. and this or that. But I think more of the big one is like, okay, so how powerful is the child? Um, mm. Is this just coming naturally? Was there a teacher? That's the big one is like, well, where's this going to go? Are there other questions? There's more we got to learn. So that was the big one I got about as well. Okay. What does all this mean? And where are we going with all this? Yeah. I, I think we're going to see that the child uh, in, in season two I think we're going to we're going to see that this this creature is far more powerful than we know right now. I think that this is the, he it it is going to be a key piece in this whole story and on and we're going to find out about it and then we're going to think about oh remember when they when he when they did this and this and this and I think Mando or we know his name now but I won't say we'll we'll, we'll <laughs> This is like, it. it's okay to say it. you can say his name it's I, Din Djarin, right? It's something like that. Uh, so, something. Jordan, something. Anyway, I'm gonna call him Mando, he, just because. Yeah, he, he, he's that's, a, like, that's a way cooler name, anyway. Yeah, yeah right? Mando is cooler, but he Mando Fat. He's been here, <laughs> here to his his job from the beginning is to protect this kid. That there is a there's a bond, instantly instant bond between the two of them, and I think both the child and he understand that, and I think that. Carl Weathers, in his speech in the beginning, is a hologram. He knows what Mando's weak spot is. He knows how to how to pull his strings to get him to do whatever he wants to do by talking about that child. Yeah. So I think I think he's there's a lot more in store for us as far as that relationship and also what that what that kid can do. Now that's a very interesting pause in here. Uh, I I will go ahead and venture out that I think that. The child is simply this is sort of what the child's natural talent is in the force because he's just too young to have been trained. I don't think he can talk yet. And I think that's where, you know, he's not a puppy. Uh, I, I have I have dogs, so I know about puppies, I guess. Uh, and so I think that he's probably going to need a little bit more more training. It's it's interesting to see the type of power that he has. I mean, he's doing these things that we see, you know, the force dyads doing. He's doing things that were amazing when we saw the Jedi Master Yoda doing them. When we saw Luke Skywalker doing these tasks, they were amazing. Let's not forget he picked up that mud horn. I mean, he just lifted it up in the air. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's that's more that's more impressive than anything we saw Luke Skywalker do in the original right. trilogy. So, I mean, we're talking about an extremely extremely powerful powerful Force user for sure, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, it's, it would be really interesting to see how much they deep dive into that background, because how does he even know how to do that, mm -hmm, you know, right. um, even before, you know, we, you know, um, before he meets up with Mando, you know, how does he even know to do that in as far as training? Is that just his natural ability? Like, you know, if a child, uh, if, if your child or whatever, you know, all of a sudden just starts singing or starting to play, you know, piano, they actually have an a, a ability to um to that they're able to tap into that not a lot of other other people are able to do. It'll be interesting to see how they develop that. Abs True. Absolutely. Now, Ken, um, you know, you've been a big proponent of the relationship between the Mando and the child. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we see them linked together from a, a Mandalorian standpoint officially here. He's given this mandate, and since it's coming up now, we'll talk about it. He's given this mandate to act as a, the father, or find its people. Do you think that? Do you think that there are a people to find for the child, or do you think that he's sort of like the last of a species? 
It's a good question. I think it's I think that whole thing like he's a foundling, right? So I think that Mando is just that whole thing about find his people, find where he came from. That's just that's just fluff. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's part of it at all. I don't think that's going to be part of his mission. I don't think he's going to do anything about that. I think he's now going to take care of this child as his own and that that's it. There's not going to be any more going on. Um, the species, as we've talked about in the past, is rare. Whatever this is, it's very rare. I, d- I doubt there's a planet of them. Mm-hmm. I just don't. I don't think that that that's the case. Um, and I think this it, it's going to be more of a that he's it. This child is it. There's no more. There was a there was a Yoda. He's gone. It was this child, and this is it. There aren't any more of this, especially not as powerful as he is. Mm. She is. We don't know. It could be a girl. <laughs> not really sure. Nobody. But, uh, nobody knows. It's nobody true. knows. It's a baby. We don't need to know if it's a boy or a girl yet. Let it discover it in its own time. All right. Let's move on. To, let's move on to the one we all want to talk about, and that's the finale. Mm. I think we're all super interested. So, yeah, so the end of episode seven sees, sees. Oh, hold on, hold on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's talk about let's talk about the end of the um the seventh episode. So the end of the seventh episode sees Mando and the gang trapped in a cantina, right? Just yeah, trapped. buddy. And <laughs> and where are Horzog is like, did you did you bring the child? I think he says it like that. <laughs> and as soon as they they find out the child's not there, like. Everyone no, is. Just... No, no, no. He said. He said. He said. I don't. I said. I don't want to. Um. I don't want to. I don't want to wake the child. And then he says, <laughs> "What does he say?" He says, "Um, we'll wait while the child is asleep or something like that. <laughs> something to the effect of, you know, we'll wait. Yeah. You know, well, no, we'll be quiet. We'll keep real quiet. <laughs> we'll be dead quiet. Yeah. <laughs> while the child sleeps. And the way he just delivered that line is just hilarious to me. I, I, I thought the double cross here, Gideon just being like, this guy's so unimportant to me that I don't, like, I'm just going to waste him right now because it's better for me to just demonstrate my ruthlessness to you. <laughs> like that's... Let's, let, let, let's, let's talk about the introduction of Moff Gideon. Yes. The way he, okay, we see, is this the, this is the first time we see a TIE fighter in the show, right? Yeah, uh, yes. Mm. And, okay. it, and its wings fold yep. when it lands? Yes. Damn. So in a, um, in in the movies and everything, it seems just normal. But by itself, it just seems like just crazy that this big Tie Fighter is just going to land and you know just the way it just lands and everything like that. Um, it it was just awesome to see. You know, he pops down. You know, it's about it's about to be somebody big in that in that thing. And the way he just steps on screen with his cape, this is the villain. This mm-hmm. is the big bad of the series, as far as I'm concerned. You know. Um, he, his introduction and anytime you get, um, Giancarlo into mm. like a role, whether it's his Breaking Bad or, you know, whatever he plays, he, he, he does, he does it. He does it to the fullest. It was great to see Moff Gideon it was, <laughs> just flex his muscle. Finally, we get to the respectable bad guy that, that we know Mando can't just like kick over, right? Cause right. he basically, they, he knocks over this Imperial outpost. Like it's nothing steals the one, the, the one thing they wanted <laughs> just leaves. So we know that the, the, this Imperial is nothing. Uh, Gideon comes in. He's John Carlo Esposito, and you know I'm a big Breaking Bad fan. I know Sam. Yep. Uh, I know you are. I know Tony is. Ken, are you are you into Breaking Bad? Not not so much. But this uh, that guy was in uh, Falling Skies. I don't know if anyone watched that um, about aliens coming down. But again, he was a an aggressor. He was a he was like a warlord. Um, and uh, same type of character. So he, when I saw him, I was like, oh, this is going to be good. Whatever right. this guy is. Ken, just cover your ears for just a second. Just cover just earmuffs just for a second. Real quick. My ear? Yeah, earmuffs. Earmuffs, because you haven't seen it. I will kill your infant Yoda. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I could think about. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Moff Gideon uh, looks like he's wearing Mandalorian armor. Is, is what he looks like. And I'll switch over to hold on a second. No one's in. You're not gonna be able to hear anyone but me. So nobody else talk until I can bring it back. Everybody. So here he is. Sure. looks like Mandalorian armor to me. That's my opinion. One man's opinion. Uh, but it does look that way. Uh, sure is a, he, he sure knows a lot of history. He knows a lot of history and he has something very important 
mm-hmm. to Mandalore and of course the remnant Mandalorians. Um, before we get there, let's talk about this <laughs> opening scene of episode eight. That is this, this is like Jason Sudeikis is one of these guys, yeah. right? Like obviously, yeah. and yeah. is it yeah. Terry Killam's yeah. the other one? I think he is. Cause I think he posted something on Twitter. And he, I think it's like Andy, Andy Cohen or Andy, it was Andy something. Um, I don't think it's Terry. But that definitely is to Jason Sudeikis. Like that voice <laughs> yeah. is so like it, the if one he, punching the child. That's <laughs> the child it. Yoda Punchers Incorporated is Jason Sudeikis. Uh, he's the type of guy that can handle that. He he plays the affable a hole. You know what I mean? Like so well. It's like it's like his best thing that he does, and he does it to great effect here. This that whole sequence was weird and funny, funny, super funny. And how Very about none, neither of the scout troopers could shoot straight? Oh my god! <laughs> what a the great best, bit. This is the best thing. They could just—they're shaking the gun like it's wrong. They could not shoot to save their lives. Scott, awesome. Scott, how did how did your wife feel with them punching in, punching a bag? She like was that? not happy about that, guys. <laughs> I just got to say this: like, if you if you want to really like injure my wife, just injure Baby Yoda. Because that will oh, hurt man. her far more than anything you could do to her. Uh, she's, oh. she's a fan. And I feel I feel like I, I've accidentally introduced her to uh, to Star Wars. Like, I, and I'll say this: like, you know, Baby Yoda. The reach of Baby Yoda is so is so vast. Like, obviously, we all love Baby Yoda. Like, we're all super positive about this. It's bringing people into the into the the fold. She's legit listening to the Darth Bane Rule of Two book on audiobook right now. So, yeah, that that that's what I found too. That you know the um baby yo- <laughs> the, child, the child the um the the entrance of or the into uh, of the the input of the child into the show is a great gateway to the universe. If you're into if you weren't into Star Wars before, um the Mandalorian is easily digestible, and having um the child in the show is a really good great gateway for those who want to have something simple but not have too much lore or you know, just, just have a bunch of different, um, you know, stuff to think about just to, you know, focus on that and everything else will, you know, come to you. Uh, It's a lot of great elements in this show that actually bring you in, you know, that, that, um, surround like the child and everything. So like, I just, I just want to say it was a really, it's a really good, great gateway for those who aren't, you know, um, in the know. So I'm, I'm super grateful about that. And it's interesting, you know, we're sitting here, um, you know, one, two weeks removed from, the premiere of a mainline numer- numerical Star Wars movie, and we're talking about the cultural impact of the TV show, which which should really tell you everything you need to know about is this show worth watching? Uh, it's it is it's excellent, and, and it's so good that it has redefined the fandom in a certain way. I know for me, I prefer this Star Wars. I prefer the gritty, western, dirty, lived-in, ageless Star Wars. To what I think we got with, uh, you know, Rise of Skywalker, which is just, it was just a lot of pop popcorn, and and to me it was it was a little bit more, I don't know, like, like we talked about in the review last week, there's this idea that anyone can be a hero that's in, uh, that is in, um, Last Jedi, and I think is in the Mandalorian that isn't present in in Rise of Skywalker, right, uh, and. Who is the Mandalorian after all of this? Who is the Mandalorian? Corey Feldman. Corey Feldman. No. <laughs> I said he looks like Corey Feldman. Oh my What's God. going on here? You know, I watched that that insane performance of his on the Today Show live. Like, I just happened to be watching that. I watched the Today Show maybe once in the last five years, and it was that day. It was crazy. You got those angels. Anyway, so he's not a fet. He's not anyone we've even heard about before from the different cartoons. He's just some guy named Dan. Pretty much like Jin Dan or something like that. Um, so I feel like the Mandalorian is reinforcing that message from the Last Jedi, which is anybody can be a hero, and it doesn't matter who you are; it matters what you do, which I like. <clears throat> yep, yep. So that's what I think about that, uh, that y'all. Um, how about IG Eleven just beating, just beating those storm, the stormtroopers to death oh, and yeah. stealing their bike? Yeah. <laughs> He came in there, you know, he, his mission was to get the baby, you know, protect, and, um, and nurse protect droid. the baby. Oh. <laughs> nurse droid. He's a nurse droid. I guess he's a nurse droid now. That banter is awesome. Uh, <laughs> I guess he's a nurse, nurse droid. Yeah. Uh-huh. 
That's he comes riding into town, and it's like you know, you know, you, you can feel you can feel the Doc Holidayness. You know what I mean? The, the tuberculotic uh, gunslinger. He doesn't have anything to live for past today because you know, a tuberculosis used to be universally fatal, uh, and he's gonna do what he's got to do to protect to protect the child. Right? He's gonna do what he's got to do to complete his mission. Um, this, that, that scene, that droid combat is so awesome when he's just flat, like he's doing this whole thing. Yeah. He doesn't have yeah, a Yeah, turning it around and right, you know, not turning his whole body, well, turning his whole body with his, um, the, the, the eye face, the face portion just mm-hmm. staying in one spot. Yeah. It was decent in the first episode. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Super nifty. And then we have the child using his force powers to push the flamethrower back at the stormtrooper. Oh yeah, yeah. That was a highlight. The the big highlight of the episode, you know, um, among um, you know, seeing Moff Gideon, <laughs> just anything Moff Gideon was um, you know, involved in, he was highlight. It it it, it really played off those re- Western tropes of okay, we have you um pinned in here, and then um, you want to come outside, partner. You know what I'm saying? Um, uh, with um, I'm trying to get them um to get them to sundown. You know, in order to make their um, decision on what they're going to do, yeah. are they going to give up the booty, give up the um, give up the um, the um, baby Yoda, or you know, just just you know, just end up dying? So you only have two choices. And I love the way that he put his choice. Um, I don't really. He said, I think he said, I don't really care. It doesn't matter to me. I'm going to make my decision anyway. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, this this really. It, Scott, do you remember what exactly Moff Gideon said? He he just said it so cold too. It was like you do not concern me, but I'll have my quarry. You have until you know you can die or not right. or something like that. Uh, he sets up that they set up that e web and it, they do it like a like a Gatling gun. You know they got to get it all put together and they got to get everything all hooked up. Um, again, the, the Western tropes were just rich in this one. Um, super interesting to me. So let's talk about the escape here. And Mando's Mando's shot in the head, and I guess you just need to spray some. Sp- I guess that just needs hairspray in Star Wars u- universe, uh, <laughs> which is cool. You know, you'd imagine they have the advanced technology, and we see his face, and we have this interesting, almost like, you know, Matrix esque philosophical discussion where IG Eleven says, "I'm not even a living thing," and it's so interesting. Like I felt an emotion here for IG-11 from this point on. Like, Mm -hmm. it seemed like he had a sense of humor and and thus an animus about him. Um, Which, I'm going to go ahead and chalk up to how awesome Quill is. Quill's just that good of a crafter. (laughs) Yeah. Well, the good, the the, the, the tee-up of that was his relationship with um, Kara. Mm -hmm. We see them developing a tighter relationship. You know, him and um, her and um, Mando. Mando and her and everything. So, um, but he would not take the mask off for it. He just would not do that. Um, then, you know, they leave and everything. And then he, um, ends up taking it off for the droid because technically, you know, the droid isn't alive. <laughs> oh, good junk. Uh, I really, and, 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 and apparently he shaves every time he, um, because he, he was a little clean shaven down there. Right. <laughs> like, okay. He's a little neat, you, you know, up off, under that mask. and everything. If you take <laughs> off a star Wars guy's mask, they are just pasty and doughy. And every single time, every single time, Darth Vader's mask. What did he look like under there? He looked like the like you know he looked like a bunch of sugar sugar cookie dough. Uh, <laughs> same thing to a lesser extent with with Ben Solo, uh, just because he was younger, less time, less time. But I think you it's a weird thing where you take off the mask and there's this like you know pale pasty guy. He's like ah. Uh, every do do time. do do you guys think it was necessary for that mask to be taken off? Like was was that nece- was that a good plot point or a good emotional take for him to have his mask off? Um, you know, during that portion of the episode, what, what, do, what do you think about that? I think they could have done it at a better time. I think it was a little bit early, even though he had some, the finale. But right. I think they could have done it in a much, much later season. Um, I see the reason why they did it. And to be honest, that's about the only thing. It's true, every time we take a mask off, it's kind of shocking. And this was in a weird way, because I really thought it's Corey Feldman. It really is. Um, like, I was actually, for the first time, kind of a little bit disappointed because of looking for something like there's no scar, there's nothing. It's nothing. just Corey Feldman, right. and that's all it is. Right. And right. I just think they could have been done in a more dramatic fashion. So, mm-hmm. eh. 
What do you what do you think about that, Ken? Uh, I think they I, I think it was put in the right place based on the fa- like like Tony said, based on the fact what what needed to be done. But also, I think it was important that we see the IG droid as as that nurse droid as wanting to help and we all know that mando doesn't like droids so mm-hmm. here's the ultimate lay yourself out good point the ultimate good point. uh mm-hmm. i'm like trying to find the right word but you, you know you're really leaving yourself open you're opening up your chest you're taking off your armor Vulner- that that's a good word Vulnerability. <laughs> so it's it's really developing his character and the droid's character for the limited amount of time that it has left but just it really puts it, it it's a moment it's one of those things it's just a moment they decided to plug it in there and you know i i i, I think it, i think it was in a good spot uh i th- i for me the the helmet thing here <clears throat> is this is the episode where we find out who the mandalorian is not not literally mm-hmm. which we do we find out his name which seems almost irrelevant which i think is excellent an excellent sort of way to do that but we find out he's his clan because he gets his signet here we mm. see his face and we find out that he's you know true to the mandalorian code which means he is going to protect the child it's almost as if until the child came into his protection he didn't even exist he was a faceless warrior and now that he has this relationship with the child that I know Ken is so very fond of, you know, he's going to be himself. He's turned into the, the patriarch of a clan. He's not just a faceless killer. And so it'll be interesting to see if that, how, what that does to change his character. Um, as we all remember from the very first episode, a little bit ruthless back then. Well, it's, so, it's sort of analog to how Finn came to be, you know, um, more than just a faceless stormtrooper, right? Yes. You know, we're talking about themes and, um, you know, tropes or, you know, whatever in Star Wars, you know, we finally see a um, stormtrooper who was more than just a stormtrooper. You know, we get a um, Mandalorian here who's more than just, you know, the, um, you know, his code and creed and everything. Um, he still has that, but, you know, with the relationship with the child, we we actually get a whole character you know, that can be, um, that we can empathize with and, you know, fill on, like, you know, all these episodes. So it was, it was really great to see. And I think the the um, thing Tony was talking about, I, I also believe that it could have been done at a different time. But now that we're talking about it, um, it may be a setup to a later time where he shows his face to, to, um, to, um, to all the other characters. We as an audience, I guess, needed to see it now. But the characters in the show will may and may not end up being being able to see his face till maybe like you know season three or you know a couple seasons down the line. But maybe it was important for us to see his face right now. Is is what I'm um, maybe gathering because he's still sticking by his code. Everything is still there, you know, as far as his code and everything. But it's going to come to a point. Maybe it's a relationship with him and Kara, or maybe some other you know um, character down the line where it's going to be very important that he shows his face to that character in order for him to, to graduate or develop or um, mature from, you know, uh, I guess beyond his code. And to prove that he's him. I mean, his identity <laughs> could be important later on. We're beyond the Mandalorian. Um, you know, we, we get this, we get this sort of like this TIE fighter attack scene and the armor gives the Mandalorian his signet. And gives the Mandalorian this jetpack, which, as we all know, mm. is they fly now. That's the the stakes have been raised, um, <laughs> and so they fly now. And then we get this just amazing scene where we've seen how a Jedi takes care of a Tie Fighter at low altitude. Now we find out how a Mandalorian does the same thing. Uh, and I thought that that parallel was intentional and awesome, in my opinion. What did you guys think about that? The the two scenes. Well, I mean, it's always cool. I mean, just the just the whole seeing the tie fighter was was awesome. I mean, just you know the the way it was done. That was you know I do see the parallel. I didn't realize until you mentioned it. So that was cool. But I just think just the I mean just seeing it. You know, um, where is this going again? How did Moff Gideon get the you know the armor that looks? I mean, there's a lot more to it. Which I guess we're going to talk about in a little bit. But um, 
the parallel. That's probably the biggest one that I, you know, just opened my eyes right now. That was kind of cool of showing that, you know, the difference between Ride Skywalker and this. You know, like how would a Madeline Morgan do it? So that was really cool. I thought it was just a great scene all together. Uh, I, I'm I'm a super big fan of, of those sorts of things when they do the sort of the the art folds on top of itself because I'm a nerd like that. It's one of the reasons we call the channel Nerd Cyclopedia. Uh, it's just a nerd. We're just nerds here. Uh, let's talk about the thing we all want to talk about, which is the sort. It's almost a like coda scene at the end here because we find that Mando and the child are going to leave. Uh, Grief and Kara are going to stay and reestablish the Bounty Hunters Guild and run Novaro. <laughs> And Moff Gideon has crashed. He's being descended on by scavengers. And all of a sudden, he... <laughs> everybody's, everybody has their... Everybody does their, their impression of this. You know. Uh, <laughs> cuts his way out of the TIE Fighter wreckage with a lightsaber that is not just a lightsaber. It is the Darksaber. Dark. Now, right. who wants... But who wants to go ahead and fill us in on the, the little bit on the dark saber? Which one of you guys wants to do that? Well, I know a little bit, and it's kind of sad that it was introduced in Star Wars Rebels. Okay, that you know that's where it was introduced. So that's a good series, but you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't even know if I would recommend it or not to get the backstory of it. Ooh. But apparently, like, it's his big Mandalorian. <laughs> Ooh, he just weapon. said, he just said, your podcast segment sucks. It's what he just <laughs> yeah. said to me. I was talking about Star Wars Rebels. I was like, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. But anyway, um, but it's, very it's Mandalorian. I, I don't even know if it's their version of a lightsaber. All right, um, my uh, but, my wife looked this up, guys. So I know. Okay. See, she told me all. So she told me all about this. So, so credit to my wife. Uh, she did. Oh, she did. Okay. Because I didn't. I don't watch. Thank, those thank, thank you, baby Yoda child. <laughs> <laughs> you did this. Uh, so I didn't watch those cartoons because uh, I'm, I'm. Oh, apparently you didn't either, huh? Yeah, I don't watch those cartoons. So I, I did watch the one episode though. So apparently there has been uh, one Mandalorian Jedi ever, ever. And this Mandalorian Jedi created the Darksaber when they made their lightsaber. And the Darksaber is a lightsaber that doesn't have any light. Hence the name. Easy to figure out. Uh, it was hidden in the Jedi Temple for thousands of years. And then the Darksaber was busted out by a group calling themselves the Death Squad, who re uses Mandalorian armor similar to what we're seeing from the Coven here and from Mando. All right, so similar stuff. So they have the dark saber, and it's seen as a, a symbol of the leadership of Mandalore, because of its importance historically as an artifact. So Moff Gideon having the dark saber indicates his uh, that he is the person who controls Mandalore. So that yeah. Mandalore okay. is within his territory as the Moff. Okay. So mm. super interesting. And obviously, they mean to make this the story next year, is about this this dark saber and about Mandalorian's uh, relationship with Moff Gideon and Mandalore itself. So that's the reason why he has on some of their um, or we think that he has on some of their armor. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's so, right. So it all could be so. So apparently, the the uh, I read a little bit too. Um, the lightsaber hasn't been seen for like a while, so. Um, it's been a number of years. It was it was buried or something, and it's been a number of years before it got um, you know unearthed again. Before it, so we don't know what happened in between the time it got buried to the mm -hmm. time of, or what happened or, or how Moff Gideon how he got it. Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Well, we know that Darth Maul had it at a certain point. It was used to fight Obi Wan Kenobi in the Clone Wars. So uh, lots of different ways to go with that. You know, Mandalorian remnant. And what what that dark saber is going to mean to him, right? What is this going to be significant for him? Uh, lots of different, really excellent places for them to go in um, in season two. Uh, you know, we said this. I said this about the Prison Break episode. Is that's the episode that tells me this show could run forever? Um, it can. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. with Bacta, apparently Mando's a mortal, and the kid's already going to live for the next thousand years. So there's a thousand mm -hmm. years worth of stories on this kid who's force sensitive, so probably won't die. Because, you know, Force-sensitive people are hard to kill. Uh, it's just the truth. <laughs> Not impossible, according to Qui-Gon Jinn. Um, I'm super excited to see where they go next. And, and, and for me to be this focused on this show, 
in this sort of proximity to a mainline Star Wars movie is a real feat. And so for me, I hope they give John Favreau the keys and say, just do it. Just handle it for a while. That's what I want to see. Um, you know, the same way we saw Kevin Feige get it for Marvel. I'm, I'm inclined to have John Favreau take a take over just to give the, the, um, you know, the, the IP some direction. Um, you don't necessarily have to tie everything into one thing, but to have a um, clear sense of it, it was just something about the Mandalorian, even though it had like eight episodes to tell its story and to um, build its characters and everything where a movie only has so much. And with unfortunately with movies, you only have so much time to do it. Um, Star Wars had uh, it's been what four, four or five years. <clears throat> so we got like the Force Awakens. We got, uh, when did Force Awakens come out? Um, 2015? 15, yeah. 15? yeah. Okay. So it's now 2019, four years. It's 2020. Four, four and a, 2020. <laughs> so well, it came out in 2019. So um, at the end of 2014, it may have came out. So we have five years of three movies. So you only have so much time to develop characters within that period and you have long periods of time in between movies to, to keep that going. Whereas this show had the benefit of having eight straight weeks of, you know, character development and a smaller scale score story to tell. So um, it's, it's either it's an apples and oranges type, you know, type of thing, you know, either you like this or you like that. You can still like both if you like fruit, you know, <laughs> um, but um, um, I, I will. I would say for myself, I love this. Mm. You know, more than the main, the main line thing. You know, I, I love this smaller scale. Um, you was alluding earlier. Um, you know, to the western type grittiness and everything. It sort of reminded me of um, Rogue One in the beginning, um, yeah. of a more mature, you know, type of st- Star Wars storytelling, which I gravitate to versus what we what we've got, what we received with like. Um, you know, the Ray Finn um, Poe, you know, um, um, thing, you know, in the mainline stuff. So I want to stop here. Not not, not to stop everything, but I want to stop the comparison talk right now just to, to, to sort of delineate because I think we were the two people who were the most, I don't want to say negative about uh, Rise of Skywalker, but the least positive is maybe the way to put it. That's fair. Um, Tony and Ken. Now, Tony, you gave Rise of Skywalker a nine. And Ken, you yep. very famously said that it's a perfect movie, and I and I and I, and I made a good art, good defense of that. I'm not knocking you or anything. Um, I want to hear from you guys. So, so Tony, first, tell me where how do you feel about the Mandalorian in relationship to how you feel about Rise of Skywalker? I like it just as much. Um... It is kind of two different things, though, because it's true. Like a movie, you have two, two and a half hours to. And that was probably the only reason I would give, you know, Rise of Skywalker not a perfect end. I mean, it really seemed like it was trying to cram so much in. There's no need to quibble. I, you know, I, I just. Yeah. I'm just saying. But, you know. In this one, no, I really, I really do enjoy it. Um, you know, I'm looking to see where it's going to go. Um, I could also see how it could start to really fail. They could really mess it up really bad, which I'm hoping that they don't do. Yeah. But no, I really, really do enjoy it. I just like the fact that, and again, not to compare to the other ones, but just threading it all together is you don't want this to be just so different that what does this have to do with everything that we've known for the past 44, you know, 42 years? There's always connections. I like the fact that there's always very few characters. I can only think of maybe. Palpatine, almost everyone is at light and dark. Almost stay right them. Like the Carl Weathers character mm. going through redemption, yeah, forgiveness, yeah. Yeah. coming back. You know, there's very, very little just concrete white, okay, this is the ultimate good guy, this is the ultimate bad guy. I mean, there's always little things here and there of how everything weaves. Now bring the droid into it of, you know, IG-11 of, okay, this is an assassin droid, but I could be reprogrammed. Do we trust it? Does it prove itself? So, I mean, I, I really do enjoy it. I just think it's very, very different than everything else. But I'm enjoying it as a story into itself a lot. Ken, how about you? You you have a, a, a vision of perfection. That vision of perfection was Rise of Skywalker. Tell me, tell me about what you feel about the Mandalorian in, in that context. 
Okay, I'm going to build on what Tony was just talking about at the end there. Perfect. So here's what I enjoy about both Rise of Skywalker and Mandalorian. I I appreciate that the the folks that wrote, worked on, acted in are are keeping true and and they are all fans of the of the of the original stories and the the feel and the uh, just the the way the, the the characters relate to each other the 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 four you know the four characters we had that with Finn and Ray and uh, Chewbacca you know the, the, and the droids you know they're they're a character we have that same camaraderie in the Mandalorian I think that I feel like they're doing this story justice they're not messing with it and they're keeping with the way the story was the conflict good and evil everybody has the opportunity to to exist in both worlds and they have to be convinced to go one way or the other. Um, like, like Tony said, the droid, well, started out bad. Now it's good, maybe, but it all, now it can make a decision almost. It has a personality so it can decide what it wants to do. Mm. Uh, I think that's important too, because all these characters are so, so human. They can make decisions. They can either be looking out for themselves or look, Look at the mission, you know, like the, the video game piece. Like, what was the mission? What were we doing? Are we going to stay on that task or are we going to do what we want to do? But everything about Mandalorian and Rise of Skywalker just feels right to me. The original feel of what Star Wars was. I think the Phantom Menace and Clone Wars uh, got away from it. I think Force Awakens and The Last Jedi sort of also got away from the original vibe that the, 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 the story was. But I think it all came back with the rise of Skywalker. And I think Mandalorian also just keeps it, it keep it real. They just keep it real. And, I, and, you know, that's how I feel. You know, to echo something that Sam said, uh, Sam said you were you said you were drawn to the more adults theme if you had the more grown up style Star Wars. And and that's something I agree with. One thing I'll say about The Mandalorian is that it, it, it feels like everybody's the things everybody does make sense. You know, the way everybody acts, even what grief does trying to turn the child back in, everybody's got their own right interests. And and for me, you know, I love the grittiness, I love the Cantina, I love the bounty hunters. If if it's me and you told me I could have either another movie on the scale of Star Wars Episode Nine, <clears throat> or another season of this. I might pick this. That's something to say because even though you know we may like it, you know, as um, you know, a, a more of an adult, mature affair, that doesn't necessarily mean like it's better. I just find it amazing that um, that this all happens in the same universe, mm -hmm. you know. It's, it's, it's like it's like, OK, you can have us over here, um, you know, talking about this and then, you know, in a daycare some somewhere, you're going to have like a clown just like, you know, dancing back and forth and everything, entertaining kids and everything. It's still all happening in the same universe, but we're we're more adults and stuff mm -hmm. and they're kids, but it's still happening in the same universe, different tones, but still the same. It's still you know, both um, the the series and the, the show, um, um, the show and the main the main um, um, movies are still delving on themes that are happening in the same universe. So I love that about that. Um, it's interesting to me about the whole dark saber thing. Mm -hmm. It hasn't been touched on in the main in the main movies and stuff, or it might, but it might end up playing its part in in the future. What concerns me a little bit is all the fill in the gap stuff mm -hmm. that we're getting right now. I'm really interested to see um, just talking a little bit about, you know, how the future Star Wars movies are going to go, how, how that's going to develop after. So um, I'm really excited about season two of The Mandalorian because it's just so many. It's just so much stuff I don't know about that, you know, like your wife that I'm just getting to now know and actually delving into. I watched a couple of those um, Rebels episodes just to get just to get my fill of you know, this dark saber thing, you know, how did that all come about and why is it there? And, you know, what does it do? I mean, that's, that's a really great, um, um, MacGuffin right there. Mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> um, so we, 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 uh, it's just a one, one of those things we, we, we'll see, you know, 
Um, like Carl Weathers says, you know, can 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 um, you know make ba- make the baby child do the the magic baby hand. Stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I, I love that. Li- I I want more. I love. I want more grief. I want mm-hmm. more care. I love watching her. You know, she she brightens up the scene every time she's on. You know, um, I, I I I the whole getting the band back get back together and everything. I wish IG Eleven didn't die. Because it will be a really great way for them to team everybody up again to just have them go on some more missions together. But I understand it's, you know, people got to come and go. You know, um, he left um, um, Grief and Kara on the planet to, to, to go take, you know, um, the child and still protect it in other places. So he's going to end up meeting other people. So <clears throat> this is exploration in the, um, other facets of the universe that we still don't even know about yet. And, or that's going to be touched upon um, that, you know, that, that, you know, like Kara, like, like, uh, like Tony and Ken, they're going to be like, ah, oh, that's where they got it from. OK, yeah. OK, yeah. They're still bringing some stuff in for maybe the extended universe, you know, that we thought was no longer canon. But they're still um, they're still making like, you know, the old guard and everything, you know, just, I guess, new again mm-hmm. <laughs> or just, you know, acknowledging that it's it's. It's really something else, and it seems like they're going in directions I want to see more of for sure. I'm excited for season two, and I'm just going to go ahead and say it say it right now. Uh, Sam, you and I make all the programming decisions on this channel. I'm going to go ahead and pull the trigger and renew Carbonite Bounty BS. All right. Second season. Yeah, buddy, we got renewed just like that. <laughs> we got the ratings we needed. We did. Yeah. We got everything we needed out of the season. Um yeah. Just, just like that. Well, a quick, quick question: Where do you guys want it to go? I mean, where do you guys see it um, going, or um, what are things? I think you touched on a little bit, Tony, of some things that you're excited to see in season two. But is there anything else in particular that you may want to see? You know, well, I'll just do. I mean, if we want to say like a little thing, we can be completely wrong about all this, but mm-hmm. I, everything's got to tie back to the original. I mean, I've been saying like this is very different. But everything that I really like, I loved going back to Tatooine. I love the cantina scene. Anything to remind me of, you know, what made me fall in love with it to begin with. You can't get that far away from it. Personally, I'm thinking that, and I could be completely wrong, but I could just see that the child, they want the midichlorians. Is everything that we're seeing, everything about all the cloning? Well, I know that, you know, there's been clones since the Clone Wars, but I'm just thinking that has something to do with it of all like episodes seven, eight, nine. I think that's going somewhere. Um, I think it's inevitable that we're going to see a Mando Moff Gideon duel. It's, I mean, they'd be stupid not to do it Yeah. when they're going to do it, but eventually it's got to come to per, you know, eventually the two heavyweights got to meet. <laughs> so when and if, and how that's all I think is going to happen. Um, you don't know. We shall see. Like you said, there's so many ways they could go with it, but, we shall see what's going to happen. I'm looking forward to it. Are we going to see Boba Fett? Yeah, that's that's what I was just going to say. Mm. I really, really, and they keep, I don't know if it's intentional Asian. or what, they keep alluding to maybe he, he's coming. I mean, we still don't know who walked up on, uh, uh, what's her name, in uh, episode six, six? The, uh, the Assassin. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Still don't know who that was. I still think that was Boba Fett. Ah. We don't know who. We don't know who that was. But they're going to bring him in somehow, and he's going to be a, a mentor to Mando. And I think there's going to be that big uh, battle between Gideon and Mando, and I think Boba Fett's going to be involved in there. I also want to see him hook back up with the Mandalores, the yeah. army. That I want to see more point. of that. And I think the child is going to be a some sort of a... a, a, a it, uh, he, he, it's going to play a part in that Ma- Mando getting back to his heritage. I think the child is going to be a part of that somehow. His identity, getting back to that, um, and, and like a video game, they're going to have all these different missions and all these different things they're going to mm-hmm. do. And I think we're going to be just as blown away with season two as we were with 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 this season. I can't you, wait. How about you, Sam? Where do you think they're going to go? Oh, I don't know. I just, I, I'm, I'm along for the ride. You know, I can't. I want to see more Moff Gideon. Um, I, I'm, I'm just expecting a lot of, you know, background with him. 
um, everything that he alludes to as far as his knowledge of, you know, uh, the Mandalorians and everything. I'm excited to see, you know, what the um, what the background developments of that. Um, and just to just to see him just um, perform. <laughs> Mo- Moff Gideon is he's, he's a performer out there, you know. Um, so it, it's 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 just going to be an exciting season too. I'm I, I'm here for it. Can't wait. Uh, for me, if if they're going to make a season of this every year for the next ten years or so, they can take their time getting to the big stuff. Uh, I I I can see more uh, bounties of the week or you know, uh, more heists of the week. And I think that could be interesting. So I think that it's got legs and I'm excited to see where they go from here. Um, I plead Lucasfilm, Disney, do not hurt baby Yoda. I, I just don't want to have to get a divorce over baby Yoda getting, getting hurt. So if anything you can do for me on that, I, 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 I hope they don't use Baby Yoda as a crutch or, you know, the child as a crutch um, to, 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 to keep viewers in and everything because you don't really need the, the child in every episode, mm. you know. And I don't think they necessarily have to use the child as like the, a ratings thing. OK, well, if he's not in there, we're not going to get people to watch because there's a lot of interesting things that's going on that doesn't even have to do with the child. So there's that. <laughs> well, I'm not saying they want to overuse him, but. I just like the idea that, you know, there's places to go in this universe. As we talked about, it's a huge sandbox. And oh, right. it seems like, you know, they got Bill Burr into this season. You know, you know, they got, uh, I, that's crazy. They got, you know, Richard Iondale in this season. They got um, Tiki Awadi in the season, right? They got everybody in the season. So uh, they, they can do whatever they want and I hope they do. And I hope it's. 10 years from now, we're talking about the finale where they finally, you know, the child removes his mask. You know, maybe that's what we're talking about <laughs> at the end here. So I want to see a, a Mandalorian Yoda. That's what I want to see. If I see nothing. You guys hear that um, they're going to have like Luke and Leia in um, the Obi-Wan series? <gasps> oh, yeah. I hear that. Yeah, Obi-Wan, that's in, that's in production. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yep. Nerdcyclopedia so. News Network bringing it to you here. <laughs> <laughs> ding, 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 young, ding. young, young. So, so they might allude to just you know some stuff that we've seen in Rise of Skywalker mm-hmm. and bring it all back to that. So that would be some some good stuff coming up on Disney Plus. I, I think that Disney has probably turned to Turner because now that they've sort of handled what they had to handle, they've got everybody's interests. I, I think the sky's the limit for him here, and and. You know, I, I, for one, welcome our new mouse overlords. Uh, <laughs> so that's it. That's that's Carbonite Bounty BS Season 1. Yep. Um, you know, huge thank you to everybody who's subscribed, everybody who's watched, everybody who's listened. Thank you so much. You're obviously what makes the show go. Um, you know, to, to Ken and Tony, you know, you finished your first season here on Nerd Cyclopedia. Uh, yes. You know, you're really a full-time member of the nerd cycle family, which means I can order you to do stuff, which is hey, terrifying. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> uh, you know, to my wife who has helped with research <laughs> on this show that I don't think she thought she would have been, been doing when we started and, and, and nursing and you nursing, know, nursing me back, back to health. Uh, nursing baby Yoda. Uh, nursing baby. Yoda. <laughs> Poor baby Scott, who's far whinier than baby Yoda. You know, and I don't have Getting that computer you. virus out of <laughs> you, you know, <laughs> get that out of here. And of course, Sam, uh, you know, as always, thanks so much for, getting the band together when we need it and, uh, you know, supporting us when we need it and kicking me in the butt and making me do, actually do the shows. So, uh, so yeah, stay tuned so to the channel because we'll still be coming up with some more star Wars stuff, you know? Um, so just make sure you stay in tune to nerd cyclopedia. We will be back with more content, to, you know, uh, satiate, satiate your needs and stuff. And, you know, keep your eyes on the website for sure. Uh, our sec, our fiction content section is going to be hopping. Um, you know, we got some stuff coming down the pipeline for you there. So keep your eyes peeled. I'm going to try to get an excerpt up ASAP of our, uh, of my bad superhero novel. So we'll get that, (laughs) we'll get that up. That's a working title, uh, bad superhero novel. So we'll get that up for you. And as always, you know, uh, subscribe where you find us, anything you give us likes, comments, um, reviews appreciated. Uh, as always, I reserve the right to give the business to any and all listeners. Yeah, buddy. There you go. And that's that. So without further ado, right. we'll kick it over. Uh, anybody have any any final, final thoughts? Anything you want to say at the end of it? 
Season two. We'll see what happens. Let's do it. We'll see you all. All right, everybody. So that's this Carbonite Bounty BS and Mandalorian podcast signing off. And uh, hey, we'll see you sometime fall 2020. All right. All right. Ah. Carbonite Bounty BS is a production of Nerdcyclopedia Transcontinental Podcasts. Nerdcyclopedia.